morning, everyone. At least uh, it's good morning here in Virginia. Uh, best wishes for your day wherever you are. Uh, this presentation uh, is talking about Space 1889, a dawn of imperialism, and we're focusing here on the uh, classic Space 1889 product. Slide. So my name is Robert Mosier. Uh, we had a little fun with the image and the text. A retired Foreign Service officer, 30 years with the State Department, worked two years at the Pentagon. My overseas service did, in fact, include Indochina, the Congo, Ireland, uh, and Moscow for four years. Also worked at the Pentagon for a couple of years and have then later worked with the uh, Department of Defense in uh, various roles for training exercises and games. Next. So, Space 1889, as I expect most of you know, uh, was originally created by Frank Chadwick and published by Game Designers Workshop, uh, later reprinted by Heliograph with supplementary material uh, and a lot of fan-contributed material. The uh, latest iteration of Space 1889, which we're not going to get into, uh, is owned by Clockwork Publishing. Uh, so we're looking forward to seeing what additions they make. This presentation is based upon those original sources, and any errors introduced are the responsibility of the speaker. It's all on me if we screw this up. <laughs> Next. So very much in the spirit, we, we cite the master of imperialism and colonialism, Rudyard Kipling. Uh, the message that he sent to America in particular about the white man's burden and the expansion and the responsibility to expand and control in his period, Earth, but we're talking now about other planets within our solar system. Next. And this is the universe that uh, Kipling was thinking of, uh, Earth, and the growing pink colors on the map and other colors as different countries embarked on colonialist expansion in the undeveloped, lesser developed parts of the world. Next. Space 1889 took it a step further by empowering humans with flight between the planets. Uh, my, mainly the inner planets, uh, the moon, Mars, Venus, and Mercury. And we'll go on to explain now, next slide, how this happened. Professor Etienne Moreau uh, identifying the luminiferous ether in between the planets, which made it possible for people with the technology of the day to actually transport themselves between planets. Next. And it's all Thomas Edison's fault. In March of 1868, he hears Professor Moreau lecture in Boston, Massachusetts on the ether, and he is inspired to design and build his own ether flyer uh, using an electric ether propeller. Next. So in October 1868, Edison contacts uh, Moreau uh, to work out different issues that he's having uh, with his design, and is finally able to apply for a U.S. patent. That patent is granted as the result of an experimental flight of his model in November of 1868. A hydrogen balloon carried the test model up to 24,000 feet, where Edison's engine would be able to operate and the propeller would function and enable the model to fly as planned to the moon. On the 28th of November, the observer team, which included an astronomer, the officers of the U.S. Patent Office, and Edison, were able to observe the impact of the flyer on the moon in what we today would call the Sea of Tranquility. And on the 3rd of December, the U.S. Patent Office granted Edison his patent. Edison then forms his company to begin building passenger-carrying ether flyers. Next. Mars, for Edison, was the obvious destination as the place closest and the most suitable for his first flight. 
based upon the idea tested in his model, a hydrogen balloon would carry the flyer with the two passengers and supplies up to the ether, at which point then the vehicle could escape from the balloon and they would then be able to fly to Mars. Edison was accompanied by the Scottish explorer and soldier of fortune, Jack Armstrong, uh, at the assistance of Edison's financial backers. You know, the money man always get a say. Next. So on the 8th of January, they leave uh, for Mars, and the voyage lasts until the 9th of March, when they land on Mars near the what we learned was the city of Sirtis Major, where they are captured by the local monarch, Amratamba the Ninth. Uh, the travel time was approximately nine weeks. Uh, Armstrong's ability to quickly learn the Martian language and Edison's own display of technological expertise enabled them to win their freedom and rebuild their damaged craft, restoring the hydrogen balloon. And on the 7th of August, they landed safely outside of Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, after a nine-week return. Then within the year, by 1871, you've got dozens of companies building flyers on the basic principles demonstrated by Edison. And the race is on now for nationalities on Earth to begin making regular trips to Mars. Next. Now, Mars and the Martians, uh, as Edison was able to begin to inform us, and then as we learn more from increased contacts as more countries sent people to Mars. Uh, it's an ancient civilization based upon the city-state model or coalitions of city-states, uh, generally located at the junctions of the canals, which our astronomers had already begun to notionally identify uh, through telescopic examination. The Martian civilization is a declining one. There is clear evidence and the surviving literature of the Martians and their, and their uh, tales recount the history of great empires that had at various times unified the planet's population into single nation, but we're currently dealing with uh, multiple political groupings. Next. So this quickly runs through the entities that are on Mars by 1889. They're going to be key key players. And as we go through the presentation, we'll describe the background to these various groupings. The Anitrian Empire is the largest and most powerful of the Martian political groups. The Boreos Hirtis League is a loose mercantile confederation, uh, slightly pro-British, uh, operating much like the trading companies in, America, in Earth history, the uh, East India Company, Hudson's Bay, and so on. The uh, Tothian Empire, a, a smaller grouping uh, than the Onetrian. Uh, the independent city-state of uh, Prince Sitani. You have the British con what becomes the British Crown Colony of Sertus Major. And then King Leopold II of Belgium uh, has his own private uh, operation on Mars in the Upper Caprates. And then you have the Caprates Free State which eventually is passed into the hands of the Belgian state. And then you have the uh, Astosapis mountain region, which is a major center for the high Martians, a, a less civilized portion of the Martian population. Next. So the Basin Trading Company, uh, in addition to having uh, a lot of interest in the mercantile activity on Mars, also has its own uh, private security force protecting those trading outposts. And, and that includes, after extended contact with Earth, two battalions of privately recruited men from Earth uh, to do their security work. Next. So Mars in the Space 1889 universe has sufficient dry land, as much dry land territory as Earth itself, with a surface area only one quarter of that of Earth for the entire planet. The map shown here, the three faces of Mars, which you'll see is a, a theme repeated in, in much of the coverage. The center map uh, 
is is one portion and then to each side and there is an overlap from those two circles at each end uh, and there's some repetition there if you closely study this map too you will also note that there are some errors in the markings the solid lines indicate the canals that still function and the hash marked lines the more faded broader lines represent an area where there is still water beneath the surface the canal no longer functions uh, and some of the portions of the map especially at the two ends disagree on where there's a functioning canal and where there may not be personally i would go in favor of if one of the part of that map says there's a functioning canal then go with that the map the canal lines also those represent agricultural zones because there is a uh, an area of subsurface water that you could use for agriculture on either side of these big canal zones. Next. The most interesting discovery that Edison finds on Mars is liftwood, a, uh, a timber plant, tree plant, that actually has anti-gravity properties. You, If you were to cut the tree down and work the timber from the tree and build it into a vessel, that vessel then has the ability to repulse gravity enough to fly, to propel itself through the air. And there are a number of Martian vessels that uh, Edison discovers are already taking advantage of this ability, this product. and the. Uh, Various Terran powers quickly recognized the potential of this when teamed with a steam engine. Uh, the Royal Botanical Gardens at Kew in London are offering rewards for viable plants and seeds, but no one has yet been able to determine how to make it grow off of Mars. The groves on Mars are generally found in the highlands controlled by these uh, less civilized and rather more violent uh, high crag Martians. The illustration shows you a high Martian king. Some of these uh, high Martians have the ability to glide, much like flying squirrels or other creatures, uh, taking advantage of a membrane that you can see in the background of the figure there uh, between their, their limbs. Uh, this becomes a problem when you're flying craft in Mars if you go into these highland regions. Next. Now we get back to the ether propeller of Edison's design, and it electrically creates waves in the ether, uh, which the waves then have the function of pulling the flyer along behind them, and the interaction creating a luminous trail behind the flyer. So as you're flying in interplanetary space, this trail makes it a little bit easier to identify where there's a craft flying. By 1872, Edison's monopoly on the uh, ether propeller is broken in court. And now that really unleashes a uh, building race between the different manufacturers. However, there is a discrepancy in the efficiency of the different propeller designs. Edison's retains a 0.05% uh, advantage over the Armstrong propeller and the German Zeppelin propeller, uh, as you see in the uh, listings below. Next. Now, as we go through the presentation, while our focus is on Mars, we're going to give you the context and the background of events on Earth that interplay with the storylines that would involve Mars and the different civil parts of the civilization there. So just before we start flying to Mars and we start interacting with the Martian states, uh, British engineers complete the uh, Indian Railway uh, across the Indian continent. Next. The uh, London to Calcutta telegraph line begins operation. So you have electric communication now uh, halfway across the Eurasian landmass. Next. The Franco-Prussian War breaks out and comes to its conclusion uh, in May of 1871 uh, with the transformation of the French Empire, the Second Empire, into a new French Republic and the transformation of Prussia into a German empire. Next. 
And the French Republic comes about as a result of the French government forces breaking into Paris. At the same time in Italy, uh, as the French had focused, focused on uh, fighting the Prussians, Italian unification advances and the city of Rome and the papal properties outside of the Vatican itself are liberated by the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies from uh, Vatican control, although they don't officially move their capital to the city of Rome uh, until July of 1871. Next. And the German Empire is declared in the palace at Versailles. Next. And the Commune of Paris is crushed by the French government as it establishes its republic. Next. On the technical front, Charles Babbage produces a prototype uh, element of his analytical engine, uh, the first functioning mechanical computer. Next. And that brings us back to Mars. So, with the Armstrong Company now building flyers for the British, the first official British expedition lands on Mars, 500 miles northwest of the city of Sirtis Major. Uh, the British are able to establish cordial relations with the Anwak of Parhun, and a commercial colony is soon functioning with the Sydney walls. Six years later, in 1878, the friendly Anwak and his son are assassinated possibly as a result of the efforts of the neighboring city-state of Gurovan. But the British presence, their forces were able to help crush this attempted coup in less than a day. And, the, and Queen Victoria then assumes the regency of Parhun to protect the surviving three-month-old heir. Those of you who are uh, knowledgeable about the progress of Indian rule, of British rule in India, may recognize this pattern of British regencies and other protectorates as territories are slowly absorbed into the British Raj in India. This is the beginning of that process on Mars. Next. So for our reference point, the British flag over the general area of Parhun near Sirtis Major so you begin to get a sense of how the Martian map is going to begin to be carved up. Next. And Britain, of course, is quickly followed by France. The Republic is able to send an expedition, scientific, of course, in the first instance, uh, that lands near Idias Fons and establishes friendly relations with the ruler there. Uh, within a year, they have an enclave functioning there. But by 1877, after four years of presence, they find themselves dealing with a Martian population increasingly hostile to the interference of the French in their efforts, in their normal lives. And the uh, results in a riot on Bastille Day as the French colony is marking the, uh, the holiday. Uh, this leads to the French sending five additional regiments to uh, Ilias Fons and in a quick campaign uh, against the city forces. They force the king to abdicate in favor of his nephew. Nobles are imprisoned and the French acquire control and ownership of land as compensation. By 1878, they put the king back on the throne with his signature on a treaty establishing a French military protectorate and French guidance in foreign affairs and extraterritorial rights for French citizens. Next. And the French presence on Mars is embodied in the presence of their troops. These are mostly from the French colonial forces that would have been also been serving in North Africa and in the Indochina and elsewhere. So they send regiments from the Foreign Legion, uh, the Colonial Infantry, as well as a couple of regiments from the Line Army, Spahis and Field Artillery Batteries to enforce their hold on their portion of Mars. Next. So now you see where we have the French presence and the British presence. Next. Meanwhile, uh, Edison had worked with a hydrogen balloon, Count von Zeppelin, 
after his experience with balloons during the American Civil War, was pursuing the idea of a steerable airship, and he settled, settled upon a hydrogen-filled rigid airship design, and this is his first successful tap, test, LZ-1 over Lake Constantine uh, along the Swiss border. Next. And on the following year, Britain buys a major share in the ownership of the Suez Canal from the Egyptians. Uh, and this safeguards the British interest by controlling the channel and their link by sea to India and their colonies there. So the empire expands. Next. Now the Belgians. They send Henry Stanley, who has already helped them expand a colonial empire in the central of, in the center of Africa in the Congo, uh, arrives on Mars in 1875, and reports that the Kropratis, Kropratis natives uh, represent a potential area of control for the Belgians and a trading partner. Excuse me. Uh, as happens in the French colony, the Belgians find themselves facing native rebellions by 1882, and they create the Upper Coprati State in 1885 to actually claim ownership and control of the territory uh, from the natives. Stanley uh, is moving around the region, signing treaties with various Martian chiefs, uh, some of them apparently not fully in embracing or uh, understanding exactly what it is they're signing away. And the Belgians begin what is later described as ruthless exploitation of the resources in this region. This will lead to protests from the international community and the Belgian parliament will force the king to give up his personal control of some of these territories on Mars, along with his personal control over territory in the Congo in Africa. Next. So you see the Belgians are operating in this area uh, on Mars, south of the French, west of the English. Next. To enforce their control, Leopold creates a Belgian legion, recruiting uh, foreign mercenaries, Belgians, anyone who would serve into a Terran force, five regiments of the Belgian legion. You see where they're distributed in his territories. And then he includes a recruited force of Martians identified as native troops, the Coprati's Force Publique, which generally functions within the area as a, a gendarmerie, uh, but paramilitary capable of place, being placed in the field for uh, military operations. Next. Meanwhile, uh, Mercury begins to get attention with the British Royal Society sending an expedition led by Sir Basil Throckmorton. Uh, and in June 25th of 1876, the same year, uh, as many of us will remember, Armstrong, George Armstrong Custer and his commander wiped out uh, in fights against the Sioux and the Cheyenne at the Little Bighorn. Uh, restless natives on Mars and on Earth. Next. And Victoria is designated to be the Empress of India. So she now is generally titled and characterized as the Queen Empress. Basil Throckmorton continues his explorations on Mercury uh, using an uh, aerial flyer and begins making claims for the British Empire on Mercury. Next. Germany also is on Mercury, uh, six months exploring the World River on that planet. Uh, Henry Stanley has returned to Earth and is expanding his explorations in the center of Africa, looking for the source of the Nile, Lake Victoria, uh, and that connection using aerial flyers. Much easier than walking through that region. Next. Now, with all of these growing empires on Mars, you have the problem of communicating with them. Edison took nine weeks to travel back and forth, uh, and you can't run an empire very efficiently with communication that's that slow. So representatives of the British Colonial Office, the Royal Navy, the Royal Mail, and the Army meet in Aldershot to address the situation 
And they quickly agree, amazingly enough for bureaucrats and military services, on the founding of the Royal Ether Dispatch Service, uh, which will uh, use a number of small, very fast ether flyers, uh, low passenger level, flying between Earth and Mars. Uh, within a year, they begin construction uh, under a royal charter uh, of their ether flyers. Next. So 1879, while they're all worrying about Mars, the Anglo-Zulu War breaks out. Uh, Sir Basil Throckmorton, Throckmorton continues his expeditions on Mar on Mercury uh, using his aerial flyer and starts exploring the dark side uh, despite the frigid temperatures they have to deal with. And France, having uh, demonstrated their expertise with the Suez Canal, launches the Panama Canal Company, headed again by Ferdinand de Lesseps, to begin the construction of a canal across the Isthmus of Panama. Next. So, with a lot of dedicated effort, uh, by May 1879, the uh, dispatch service's first ether dispatch flyer, the Farnborough, is launched uh, at Farnborough. And under the command of Admiral Sefton Inwood begins its 10 days of trials and then launches on her maiden flight to Mars. That trip is completed in 43 days, a record, uh, with a uh, design speed achieved of 5 million miles per day. Uh, she's joined within a year by two more dispatch vessels, the Aldershot and Portsmouth. So we're beginning to increase the ability to communicate between Mars and Earth uh, improving the ability of the bureaucracy to function. Next. But this comes at a timely moment because the uh, first Parhon succession war breaks out when Gorovan again attempts to interfere within the uh, succession of its neighbor. And the uh, regency, which had brought the shipyards on Parhun under British control, uh, meant that the Gorovangian army is uh, facing a much more substantial British force uh, led by the Regent Commissioner, Sir Philip Adelaide, uh, facing his first major challenge. Next. British officers and men uh, of the Royal Artillery served alongside uh, the Parhun sailors on their cloud ships uh, incorporating modern machine guns and field guns lashed to the decks of the Martian, the Parhuni screw galleys, enabling them to quickly defeat uh, Gorovan's cloud ships. And in addition to which, the Parhun rifles, uh, raised and organized by the British on Mars uh, and incorporated as the 1st Battalion Queen Victoria's own Martian rifles, the Parhuns, uh, with Henry Martini rifles, uh, make a quick... Uh, victory against the uh, Gorovangians. As a result, Gorovan now is the next Parhun, linking those two together under British control. Next. And you see the British area of control is expanding. Uh, the French and the British still pretty much with the same footprint. Next. That brings us to 1880, with William Gladstone succeeding as Prime Minister. Uh, the, the British established a, a permanent station at Mercury's North Pole for continued study and providing a base for scientists. Airborne cameras are now placed on aerial flyers and ether flyers to improve mapping and, in other ways, improve the uh, knowledge both of the other planets and of the spaces in between. And the French decide that they want Tahiti, both to provide a place for their painters to work and also a vacation spot in the South Pacific. Uh, next. But even with that victory over the Gorovangians, Britain finds itself uh, clashing with Sirtis Major and its client states, including Hot, Avenal, and the British regulars take the field uh, alongside uh, local Martian troops uh, in defense of the Crown Colony. As a result of the British victory in this conflict, the Crown Colony now expands to include Sirtis Major Hot and Avenel, 
governed by now Lord Dundas. The victory also enables the British to build a new shipyard at Sirtis Major. And within a year, that's launched the first of two the first two aerial gunboats of the aphid class, steam-powered, liftwood, hulled uh, Royal Navy ships. And the two adjacent areas of Morris Lacus and Meepsor, seeing the way the political and military winds are blowing, signed agreements to become treaty dependencies of the Crown Colony. Next. So Mars, 1882, the continued expansion of the British footprint on Mars. And we're adding the second Belgian flag now is just simply a repetition to show you where the two ends of the map copy each other, they replicate each other. That's the same Belgian colony shown on both ends of the three faces of Mars map. Next. This is the HMS Aphid, 160 tons. The uh, cannon on the foredeck there and uh, Maxim or Nordenfeldt guns on the uh, port and starboard sponsons as you see them there. Steam powered. And the below the main deck, you see the horizontal lines. Those show where the liftwood panels are incorporated into the whole structure to provide the anti-gravity lift to support the vessel. Next. Meanwhile, Britain uh, comes to a, uh, an arrangement in the Treaty of Pretoria with the Transvaal Republic and recognizes the latter's independence. The regime in Serbia forms an alliance with Austria, hoping to uh, strengthen the government there against internal unrest as uh, the population in Serbia is not happy with the line they're taking. Next. And we begin to see now, this is the storyline of what's been going on Mars, beginning with the first expedition in 1873, which departs and is never heard from. Uh, a second expedition, a third expedition, a rescue expedition. Uh, finally, in 1878, the, the German Heidelberg expedition, using dirigibles, lands on Venus and is able to ascertain the fate of the first three expeditions. Uh, they eventually will locate a survivor in 1884 of the earlier expedition. But the other thing that the Germans are able to inform everyone is that because of the Venusian magnetic field of unusual intensity, uh, this affects the liftwood that was incorporated in the flyers that were taken to the planet before and corrupting its ability to lift its anti-gravity power within three days of landing. So the liftwood vessels are not going to be usable on Mars, I mean on, on Venus. But the Germans, with their advantage in airship technology, uh, already have the perfect vehicle, and they quickly expand their presence on Mars, establishing a colony and appointing a German colonial governor uh, to take residence running that portion of Venus. Next. And the uh, government in Serbia changes hands. Germany, Italy, and Austria-Hungary form the Triple Alliance of greater fame later. Next. And in 1882, we have another major advance now in communications between Earth and Mars and the other planets, but we begin with Mars. And that is with the construction of the orbital heliograph station Harbinger, and a sister station for SAGE, which are each completed in orbit, one above Earth and the other above Mars. And they are equipped with giant mirrors. And you can see the circular device, the face of the mirror above the structure of the vessel there, which actually operates as an orbital station. It doesn't move uh, from its location except to be able to transmit messages and receive messages from the other station above Mars. So they can communicate between the two stations, and each station in turn then, during the night, can communicate with the surface of the planet. So this greatly speeds up transmission of message traffic uh, between Earth and Mars. Next. 
So we go back to the travails of King Leopold II and his problems on, on Mars, given the way he's been treating the Martians. And the Belgian forces that he's deployed in their controlled territory find themselves frequently clashing with adjacent populations of Martians. These adjacent populations have been burdened with refugees fleeing from the Belgian-controlled territories. Enclaves result of angry Martians from the Coprates, who then make raids into Coprati-held territory, clashing with Belgian forces. This results in Belgian forces then breaking out of the territory in hot pursuit of rebels. And a general anti-human attitude begins to break out across Mars during 1889, driven by the accumulated grievances primarily involving the Belgian colonies, but you also had the clashes in the French holdings uh, that we saw earlier. The uh, situation is beginning to get out of hand. I and mean, this is one of the crises that's building up towards the original conflict that was the premise for the space 1889 universe. Next. So you can see here, you have the French, the uh, Belgian flag, the red star on blue is the flag of the free, of the Caprati's free state that the Belgians basically run, but Leopold still got his thumb on that and the expanded presence of the British there uh, now focused on Sirius Major, but including Parhu and Misor and the others. Next. Because of the activities of a British consular officer, Roger Casement, who had served on Mars and in the Congo and extensively reported on Belgian atrocities and spoke on them during lecture tours, other celebrities, Arthur Conan Doyle and Mark Twain, also speak out against Leopold's rule and against Belgian mistreatment of both the Martians and the Congolese. Next. Slipping backwards a little bit to give you the background, you've got the South African Republic now succeeding the Transvaal. You've got French troops expanding control in Tunis. And the Orient Express makes its inaugural run between Paris and Istanbul. Next. The Germans continue to develop their Zeppelins, and you have an illustration of the LZ-5, a lightly armored scout airship. Uh, the Prussians build 12 for themselves and export to other nations, six to the Austria-Hungarians, six to Italy, five to the Spanish, and five to Turkey. Uh, but these can also be transported uh, in a deconstructed kit bash form uh, to other planets. Next. Now, with enough people settling on Mars, you have adventurers from Earth migrating to Mars and acquiring these aerial flyers operating as merchants or as privateers, sort of turning their hands to any sort of work they might be able to acquire. Uh, any little job that might come their way. Uh, the British try to use these to supplement their small aerial squadron. Uh, the colonial governor uh, even offers them weapons to arm their ships. The Aryan pirates in the Aryan's mountain ranges near the British Crown Colony are the first ones to designate these Earth captains as red captains. Uh, but many of them find that there's a lot more money to be made as cargo in the uh, chasing chasing rogue Martians and pirates uh, apparently doesn't pay very well. Next. So 1883 also begins the uh, arrival of the Russians on Mars. Their first expedition in Sabraria Sub uh, near the Hecatis Lacus city-state. The Russians are able to uh, introduce their Gorlov guns, which is a, uh, a Gatling gun with Russian crews, to support one of the local dynastic factions in a struggle to control the city. Uh, and so much has happened in uh, the British Crown Colony and in the French presence. The Russians insert themselves into local 
political contests and then translate that into actual control of a colony under their crown. Uh, you see the interest in the Tsar also in having a place to send prisoners more than si other, the farther away than si Siberia. And a Russian colony is established uh, within the year. Next. So there shows you the location of the Russian colony. Next. Referring back to the Red Captains, one of the most famous of them was Frederick Gustavus Burnaby, uh, first man to cross the English Channel in a steam-powered aerial vessel. He then took his vessel to the Sudan, uh, where two such vessels were operated in support of British operations uh, against the Mahdi. And he would then migrate to Mars uh, and operate as one of the Red Captains there, uh, participating in as a privateer and in uh, merchant trade. That was also in Sudan, uh, was one of the first uses of aerial flyers in a military role on Earth. Next. So 1883, the British launched that campaign against the pirates in which they try to uh, suppress piracy coming out of the hills and they try to enlist the Red Captains to help them. Uh, they send a punitive expedition into Shastapash and bombard the capital there using their aerial flyers. Then they follow the uh, three years later with the overland campaign, capturing the city and bringing that city into the crown colony. As a result of these expeditions, though, the British find that their forces and Anitrian forces clash along the front, their common frontier near Avenel, uh, bringing the, uh, the threat of war very close. The British, nevertheless, were able to maintain fairly good relations with their own subjects uh, and weren't facing the internal stresses that the uh, Russians, the French, and the Belgians are dealing with. But in 1889, they do find themselves with a formal war declared uh, by the Onitrian Empire and their allies against Britain. And this is against the background of the growing uh, native Martian uh, resentment of the uh, Earth presence at various points on the on the planet. Next, so you see the uh, Anitrian warrior uh, in his imperial guard dress there with his weapon, uh, generally giving you the area controlled by the Anitrian Empire and its allies, bumping right up against the British Crown Colony. Next. So as a background again, you've got Gordon in Khartoum. The Irish are causing their usual kinds of trouble, only this time uh, they acquire the Fenian ram and are attempting to attack British shipping on Mars. Uh, they are facing privateers under a letter of mark, trying to chase them down. Although the interest quickly wanes trying to catch him and they revert, most of them revert to uh, to merchant activity on Mars. Meanwhile, Germany occupies Southwest Africa. Next. And by 1884, the Japanese arrived on Mars. They established a scientific research post called Unebi Station near Exunus Lacus. They gained access to the shipyard at Exunus Lacus with their friendly relationship. Uh, and they soon guard their scientific station and their friends uh, in the adjacent city with the deployment of Japanese troops, uh, an infantry regiment, uh, field artillery, cavalry regiment. Next. And you can see where they are located, not far away from the Russian colony. Sometime after 1889, that makes you wonder if they don't have a little problem. Next. <clears throat> So in 1885, a conference is summoned in Berlin of the various powers in order to try and reduce the frictions and clashes. Uh, both the Germans and the British have had clashes with each other in a number of locations, and they begin to think that some kind of common agreement to define spheres of influence and set out rules for colonization on Earth and other planets in the system probably be a good idea. Uh, they divide Africa and the planets and the spheres of influence controlled by different powers. And that then uh, 
sets the stage for a little bit more convivial sharing uh, of the territory, both in Africa and in uh, and on Mars and Mercury and Venus. And you see the uh, the British again using aerial flyers and military operations in uh, northern Bechuanaland, land, uh, expanding their empire there. You note also this is Karl Marx's Das Kapital is published. Next, Geronimo has surrendered in the American Southwest. This is another, and in spite of the agreement, 1885, you see we have another incident between German and British aerial vessels and growing frictions there. Gladstone addresses Irish uh, demands for a greater uh, autonomy and independence from London with the Irish Home Rule Bill. Uh, there's change of government in Bulgaria and the first meeting of the Indian National Congress. Next. And the Russians deploy their aerial craft, the Tsarina class aerial gunboat uh, on Mars, six vessels in that uh, class. They deploy a battalion of infantry, a uh, cavalry regiment from the Don Cossacks, artillery, and they are projecting the creation of a Martian unit, the Imperial Sabrina Grenadiers, uh, which would uh, be part of that uh, body of Grenadier regiments generally considered to be the Imperial Guard for the Tsar. Next. Now, the German Zeppelin technology has now advanced to the LZ-41 with five in service, and now on the basis of this platform, they create an independent airship Dutch detachment. The Luftschiff Arbeitelung uh, is formed. This is primarily on Earth at this point. Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee is marked by the successful destruction of the Fenian Ram, although its creator survives and escapes and is uh, a fugitive on Mars, as far as they know. A successful aerial campaign against the Martian pirates in the highlands. This including a number of the Red Captains. Uh, a German princeling is erect, elected King of Bulgaria. And the French succeed in avoiding a coup d'etat by General Boulanger. But France also creates its Union Indochinoise, pulling together the territories it controls in, in uh, Southeast Asia. Next. So the British continue to see the value of the aerial flyers, and they weren't happy with their first attempt at a heavier class of uh, ship with the Reliant class. Uh, so they introduce a Dauntless class, two now in service on Mars. Then they are constructing the Thunderer class monitors. And these are intended to be primarily flying batteries uh, intended to engage enemy vessels at long range. So they're not depending on speed, they're depending upon their firepower. Uh, 1885, they mandate the transfer of all aerial flyers to the Royal Navy and the Royal Navy control, both to strengthen their fleet and also control its technology, technology related technology. And this sees the introduction of a number of aerial gunboats, both on Earth and on Mars, some sold for export to the Dutch, you see there, one deployed to the Dutch East Indies. And in 1886, also the creation of the Ether battleships, going beyond even the, mon the Thunderer class monitors with the Duke of York class, uh, including the Royal Duke's vessels, Duke of York, Duke of Cambridge, and Duke of Clarence. Uh, two years later, the aerial gunboats are expanded with the Macefield class. The Intrepid class aerial cruisers are launched in 1889. And the Triumph class. So you're beginning to see a real serious Royal Navy aerial fly, fire, fire feet, fleet uh, taking shape both on Mars and on Earth. Next. And here's the illustration of the Duke of York class of Ether battleship. These are primarily intended to operate in the higher altitudes and provide a bombardment platform for targets on the surface of the planet. Uh, they can engage any vessel that might attempt to try to come up and reach them and interfere with them. Uh, 
And if they were to face another class vessel of the same class that could reach uh, cannon range at their altitude, they could presumably engage each other. But it's a more capable form of the monitor in sense, basically designed to control the surface territory over which it flies. Next. One of the things that Space Age 89 encompasses in its concept of battle and warfare in the universe is that there is no combat while you are between the planets transiting the ether. The ether battleship, the class that we just discussed as stated, are primarily intended to control the planetary airspace and engage the surface and to engage any vessels that might try and challenge uh, that control. Next. So 1888, Wilhelm II becomes Kaiser of Germany. Benjamin Henry Harrison is president of the United States. Sarawak on Barneo, which was the creation of what were called the White Rajas, white adventurers, British adventurers who settled on Barneo and established small kings, kingships, uh, becomes British protectorate. Uh, there's another crisis on Onitria as the United States minister to the Onitrian court is kidnapped by the king to be rescued by British gunboats uh, in an assault on his uh, sanctuary in the Estapis Mountains. So there is cooperation between the powers when it's to their common benefit, as in this case, to reduce the power of the different Martian states. And in Brazil, Pedro II abolishes slavery. Next. So 1889, the crisis year, as we already know, uh, there's a civilization beneath the surface of, Mar uh, of the moon, Luna, is confirmed, and contact established with that. Uh, there's an attempt by the French anarchists to destroy the heliograph station, Harbinger, above Earth in Earth orbit. And in the United States, aerial flyers are used uh, in rescue missions in the aftermath of the Johnstown, Pennsylvania flood. And that sees the promotion then of a permanent aerial search and rescue service uh, launched by the U.S. government as the New York Times pushes for that. Uh, in Abyssinia, the King John IV dies, succeeded by Menelik II, and the Italians uh, mass troops in Eritrea and Somalia on the Ethiopian, on the Abyssinian borders as a prelude to uh, trying to gain control of Abyssinia as an Italian colony. Next. Now, in response to a degree to the Royal Duke class of flyers, Germany uh, launches Wuhan, Wotan, the uh, aerial fortress, and a second vessel in that class, the Thor, using a mixture of liftwood and hydrogen cells for lift, drawing on their Zeppelin technology. Uh, the Germans put install eight large gimbal-mounted propellers, enabling them to move the vessel both horizontally forward or vertically. The French fortress, the Charlemagne, uh, does not appear to have the same kind of gimbaled propellers, but it carries a battalion of Marines uh, in addition to its uh, weaponry, its cannon, and has the capability of remaining aloft for, one, for at least a month of cruising. Uh, so whether or not these are intended to challenge the uh, Duke of the Royal Duke class are to fulfill the same mission for the Germans and the French will determine on the demands of war. Next. So interplanetary travel now is becoming pretty routine. Uh, you've got small battery powered craft flying between Earth and uh, Luna, between the moon. Uh, you have longer interplanetary flight taking place between Earth and Mars and Mercury and Venus using uh, steam-powered vessels powered by solar boilers. They're uh, capturing the uh, rays of the sun, using that to generate steam, and the steam then powering the ether propellers. Uh, the outer planets, Jupiter and beyond, and the asteroid belt are still out of reach because of the dependence upon solar-powered boilers means that you can't go beyond 
a point where the heat of the sun is no longer enough to generate steam. And you have to use solar powered boilers because no vessel can carry enough fuel in the form of coal or coke uh, to sustain the boilers for the duration of the flight and travel quickly enough to be an effective form of communication between the planets. Uh, the slowest planets, vessels can make a million miles a day. Do you remember the speed record was five million miles per day? But you now have regular commercial vessel traffic between Earth and Mars and Earth and Venus. Mercury simply doesn't have enough to offer yet for us to uh, offer regular traffic. As you see, voyages to, to Luna and Mercury are more irregular, probably as the traffic demands. Next. Now, the United States, both on Earth and in the planets, is endorsing its open door policy, a, an attitude of arguing that we want to see free trade and movement between all of these nations and their colonies, especially for Americans, without the burden of having to actually run a colony anywhere. But it means that just about all of the colonies on Mars and the other planets, there's some small American presence in the form of merchants, diplomatic consular representation, missionaries, I imagine, others. Uh, and so the, uh, the, U the U.S. has deployed to Mars, uh, mostly based at Thiamiata, uh, but also deployed in small detachments elsewhere. You'll note there's a company of U.S. Marines that's here just major, primarily with the function of protecting the American legation there. Uh, and you have a cavalry troop and you have a battery of artillery, uh, but all in the support of the American open door policy. Next. And you can see the American flag marching, marking that area uh, near the French and the Belgian colonies. Uh, next. So the U.S. expands their presence on Mars with the construction of a rocket sloop aerial flyer, an aerial gunboat, the Kearsage. Uh, note that as a former American diplomat consular officer, I have to ensure you that there is no truth to the rumors that American citizens from the former Confederacy uh, are setting up colonies on the other planets. Nor is there an official U.S. government policy of encouraging veterans from the U.S. troops that fought for the uh, Union during the war from the freedmen population or from the former slave population. There is no U.S. policy of encouraging them to emigrate to the other planets. Next. So it's a little discussion now as we've reached uh, 1889. Uh, I'm going to walk through a number of slides that will show you the order of battle for the forces Queen Victoria has available uh, on Mars to defend and expand. Uh, we're going to begin with the, primarily the Martian uh, colonial infantry and the different forces by the states under control of the crown. Uh, Martian colonial infantry, Parhunese infantry, including the Parhun rifles were mentioned earlier, uh, Gorovangian levies, Mipsori infantry, the Fencibles, the Anwanik, Anwakian guard, and the Morris Lacus infantry. The illustration there uh, gives you an idea of what the British uniformed and trained Martian colonial troops would look like, primarily light infantry. Uh, armed with uh, weapons of a generation older than the rifles that would be given to regular British troops. Next. The cavalry forces, for the most part, cavalry on Mars are mounted on the local creature, the Gashant. Uh, they have not yet been able to guarantee survival of enough forces in transit from Earth to Mars uh, are to sustain them on Mars uh, to support large cavalry forces. You may see individual horse-mounted officers. You may see private citizens with horses. But for a military force, the logistics challenge of carrying enough fodder as the army moves across the Martian surface is insurmountable to date. They, they've not been able to crack that problem yet. So we're going to be using the local, local Martian creatures as mounts for our cavalry units. 
And again, you'll see the different units of the different entities within the uh, Martian crown colony and how many squadrons each of them represents. Next. And that includes uh, other branches besides infantry and cavalry, garrison artillery for defense of the different populated areas and fortresses and shipyards, field artillery to accompany the army, uh, light batteries of various kinds, all of these manned by the uh, locally recruited Martians or troops of the different states that make up the Crown Colony. Next. The Crown forces, the British forces on Mars, you see we begin listing here with the infantry. Uh, most of these are regular British Army units. Uh, Royal Marine Light Infantry as well. The 62nd St. John Fusiliers uh, are unique. They are a locally recruited on Mars unit listed as Amazonians there. It's an all-female contingent recruited from the British settlements on Mars. You have a British Mounted Infantry Regiment, and the Australians have contributed a Mounted Infantry Regiment to the British forces on Mars, especially as we're facing this 1889 war uh, with the Onetrian Empire. Next. And again, the mounted forces, Lancers, Dragoons, Hussars, and the artillery, uh, including Gatling guns, 12-pound uh, guns, howitzers, siege guns, uh, more automatic weapons in the Hotchkiss and the Nordenfeldt guns, as well as two companies, Royal Engineers. Okay. Next. Now, facing them, we have the uh, legions of the Anitrian Empire, uh, Martian forces, generally organized uh, in legions with two to six companies each, and from the different component states, uh, the city-states within the empire, Anitria, Crossia, Delta Ton, Ostrovsk, uh, Skorosia, Ipasia. And you see they each, they each are supported by uh, cavalry. Also, the Anitrian Empire, like a number of the other Martian city-states, has also recruited uh, mercenaries from Earth uh, to expand their forces, potentially provide a training cadre, uh, to teach them how to fight uh, the British Crown or the other Earth forces that they're going to be facing. Uh, again, you have the uh, cavalry mounted on Martian uh, beasts, and then you have the Martian artillery uh, in the guns. Most of these are muzzle-loading guns of various sorts, rod guns, rogues, lob guns. Uh, if, you've, uh, if you're familiar with the, sky cl if, with the cloud ships that the Martians operate, you'll have encountered rod guns, rogues, and lob guns. Uh, uh, manning those vessels, arming those vessels. Next. Now, the Allied state of Shasta, 10 flags of infantry, two infantry war bands, a cavalry band, a gun section, much smaller force, and again, incorporating a battalion of Irish volunteers, the Fenian battalion. Uh, if you're going to fight the British, you can always find an Irishman who's willing to help you out but supplemented as well by a tripod squadron of three light storch combat tripods manned by German volunteer crews. None of this, of course, with the knowledge or approval of the Kaiser. Next. Now, among the things that we won't cover in this presentation, we won't talk about speculations about the presence of Sherlock Holmes in the period of 1890 to 1892, when he wasn't apparently doing much on Earth that, uh, Conor, that uh, Dr. Watson would report on. And Leto von Horbeck's leadership of the Martian Ascaris during the Great War goes way beyond this period. We won't discuss that. Uh, we also aren't going to address the reports of the presence of a, the emergence of a commune started by survivors of the Paris Commune on Mars uh, recruiting both earthborn socialists and Martian adherents to these theories. And we will not talk about the attempts to apply ramjet or turbine, technology, turbine engine technology to ether flight. Uh, that's getting too far beyond our period. Next. So here we are, Mars 1889. The war is about to begin between Britain 
the Crown Colony and the Anitrian Empire. Uh, the Belgians are contending with unrest within their Crown Colony and the friction with the varying neighboring populations. The French are facing a growing discontent within their colony. We haven't heard much about what's going on inside the Japanese colony. They're apparently maintaining friendly relationship with their neighbors to the scientific station. And the uh, Russians, uh, we haven't heard much from them. The Germans also have not been uh, apparently troubled by a lot of discontent within the areas that they control. Now, the additional figures on this, bar, on this map, you see the image of the Martian High King uh, recreated again. Uh, they're also they also indicate on this map the location of the various liftwood groves, which uh, in 1889 are still primarily controlled by these Martian populations in the high mountains. Uh, no crown colony, the neither the crown colony or any other Earth presence has been able to guarantee full control and exploitation of a liftwood uh, grove as yet. So this would clearly be a goal for one of them to try and achieve in the face of the high Martians, uh, as well as this war goes on between the uh, Crown Colony and the Anitrians. So thank you very much for your patience as we uh, barreled through a lot of that information. And we're uh, open to some questions. Yes, the Germans and the Irish can always be counted on to uh, get funded. There's also the uh, potential presence of uh, Americans uh, involved. Other than that, then thank you very much for coming. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the uh, conference and the other presentations this weekend. Thank you.